So good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you as you join us uh, for this third in a series of six uh, webinars um, looking at local transport planning uh, for the future. Uh, my name is Malcolm Calvert, and I'm the Director of Digital Services at Sistra Limited, uh, and it's a great privilege for me to be chairing this session uh, for you today uh, that's brought to you by Sistra and uh, Landor. Um, I'm delighted to say that we've got uh, a panel of four very esteemed uh, practitioners who are working in the forefront in our industry when it comes to our topic today, which is future mobility and transport technologies. So I'm going to introduce all of them uh, to you in a moment, but first just a little bit of housekeeping about today's session. The session will last for one hour and 30 minutes, so we'll finish at 12 noon. Each speaker will give a 10 minute presentation uh, during the first part of the session and then the second half will be a panel discussion. So there's lots of opportunity for you to uh, ask questions and thank you to those who've already sent some in advance. Um, you will see on your screens uh, that there's a Q&A section and I would ask you if you could kindly put your questions that you have uh, in the Q&A section and you can do that throughout uh, the session. Uh, and then once the presentations are, are complete, we'll be able to pose those questions uh, to the panel. If you have a question that's specific to a certain panel member, please uh, include their name uh, in the question and we'll be able to direct it towards them. We also do have a chat uh, area, so feel free during the uh, session to share your thoughts, comments, and interact uh, with each other. And we hope that, uh, that there's a lot of uh, interaction and sharing of knowledge and experience throughout. If you can keep the questions to the Q&A section rather than the chat, that will make my life uh, easier when it comes to bringing those questions later on. Uh, and finally, just to say that we are recording the session and uh, you will get a link to the recording and the slides uh, at the end as well. So without uh, any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker uh, today. Uh, Jorgen Peterson is the Director of Transport Technology at Sistra Limited. He's got over 30 years of experience in delivering transport technology projects uh, throughout the world. Uh, including enterprise asset management, intelligent transport systems, smart city initiatives, and um, much, much more. Uh, Jorgen is now leading the future mobility and transport technology team at Sistra, and he's going to be speaking to us today about the key opportunities and barriers to providing convenient and affordable new mobility services uh, for all. So uh, welcome, Jorgen, and over to you. Thank you all. Let me just share my screen. Thank you. Uh, hello all, I'm Jürgen Peterson. I'm the Sector Director of Transport Technologies with Sistra. Um, as Malcolm has just suggested, I'll be going through a, a quick overview of mobility as a service, really specifically looking at the barriers and success factors, critical success factors in, in uh, delivering quantifiable and, and outcome achievable um, uh, solutions. After that, I'll do a very, very short synopsis of uh, autonomous vehicles. Now, I want to be—I want to give an apology at this point. Initially, we suggested we were going to do a much larger section on autonomous vehicles. What we've decided is that will come next. So we'll be going through that relatively quickly um, as we move forward. But first, do we really understand what mobility as a service is? Um, I think it's fair to say we all have our own perceptions. I also think it's fair to say that if we uh, asked uh, 10 different people, we'd probably get 20 different answers. The fact of the matter is, it does change, it does shape shift. Um, and the reason being is because it does come down to modal availability, opera enga operator engagement, demographics. Um, it comes down to, to accessibility, what, what solutions and what services do you need to accomplish? Um, there's also the other questions that we do need to answer, answer in a lot more detail than we're going to today. What's the commercial proposition? Um, and are we really aware of the time it takes to design, develop, and deploy a solution as, uh, as, as Mars? And what could we be doing differently to make that process easier? I think it's, it's fair to say that what we're trying to achieve, though, is the best possible integrated and accessible transport solutions at the best of all uh, costs 
um, to a large number of commuters, riders and travellers. Um, and I think if we stick that into the back of our heads, then we'll, we'll do well to, uh, to, to make sure that comes to the fore. I'm going to really start, though, by suggesting what isn't Mars. And the reason I'm doing this is because almost on a day-by-day -day basis, one of these elements will crop up. Um, and some people suggest to us that actually it's just an app. It really isn't. And I've got to, I'm going to go so far to say the technology is probably the simple element of mobility of the service. Um, I've got to be honest, it's the term I've, I've started to, to not like. Mobility as a service comes from software as a service, which essentially means providing a cooker cutter approach to providing software to customers with a small layer of configuration. That isn't what Mars is. Mars is all about everything else. It's about how we, we do integrated ticketing, how we, how we combine fixed route transport with DRT and with the active social and, and, and even private modes of transport. There's so much more to it, and none of it's similar to each other. Um, so if you go to one transit agency or transport agency and you go to another, there's a huge difference between what they're doing, how they're doing, and what their operational processes are. Uh, and I think we're underselling mobility as a service by, by that term itself. And I think we should probably come up with something much better. From my point of view, it's, as I said, it's not about the technology. The technology is uh, the, the, the simpler element of this. It's really about the people, the stakeholders. Um, you have to remember that every stakeholder will have their own motivations, will have their own agendas. Um, and rightly so, that's their job. Um, but we need to better understand what those are. We need to better understand how to collectively bring those together. And we need to better understand how, where the level of compromise can be achieved in order to move some of these future mobility solutions uh, forward. And from my point of view, I think it all, always starts with a very clear vision, a very clear set of business objectives. And I would even go so far to say, at this point, even set out your baseline measurable expectations, whether that's decarbonisation, vehicle miles travelled, uh, fare simplification, whatever that happens to be, set them out in stone now, and then actually look back at those and see how, how you've achieved those goals. And of course, the business case. So how do we achieve our goals? One of the things that came, came up literally only a week or two ago was some of the perceptions out there. Um, and one of the perceptions was from a transit um, authority who, who basically suggested that if we introduce active social um, modes into the mix, there's going to be, a, there's going to be a, a marked decrease in public transport utilization. And again, as a consultant, uh, we, we learn from others, uh, as, as everybody else does. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is, we're all saying that there's going to be an improved, improvement in public transport ridership. But is there actually evidence for that? And it took me a long while to find it, because most of these, there isn't a lot of um, analytics undertaken on the back of them. But what I was able to find was, was this one from Gothenburg. And I actually found two examples of this, one from Gothenburg and one from Sydney. Um, and both of them identify the fact, if you look at the four, the four bottom categories on the right-hand side, they identify that tram increased by 5%, a local bus increased by 35%, um, BRT increased by about 100%, and train about 20%. Um, likewise, there was a decreasing private car utilisation by about 50%. So it's all heading in the right direction. Now, Gothenburg was a fairly small um, pilot when this when this was um, when this when this analysis was undertaken. Um, but if you look at Sydney's, which is actually much more in depth, there's about 250 pages of, of very interesting content there. I think you'll start to see some of that. But I think the other elements we have to we have to demonstrate, though, particularly um, now, our social demographics. Um, and I was actually in an LTP roundtable discussion a couple of weeks ago, and one of the comments that came out from that was, they think we're doing an injustice to, to mobility by calling it mobility. It should be called accessibility. And I think that's another element we should be looking at, how to make, how to make all the services associated with mobility as a service accessible to the widest number of people. A couple of other elements I think we should be looking at is, as we move forward with mobility as a service, um, solutions, we really need to develop a roadmap which, map, map, which is going to continue to evolve um, in implementable and, um, shall we say, bite-sized modules which are easy to use and which demonstrate continuous improvement. 
one of the other areas, areas that really sort of get me a little bit is why not just use Google? Um, and Google doesn't do anything like what we're trying to achieve. If you try and do a, a Google search on um, using um, an active mode and a, a public transport mode, you won't get anything back. Google does car journeys, uh, public transport journeys, cycling journeys, or walking journeys. You cannot combine those. Likewise, if you want to try and put a configuration layer and say I'm in a wheelchair or um, I'm not, I'm mobility impaired in some other way, or perhaps I'm, I'm a very active person and want to use active modes more than anything else, again, you won't get anything back. Um, other areas that I think we should be looking at is fair products and payments, how to make that as simple as possible. It's an area which we know does um, lend itself well to adoption and, and by contra, by uh, in, the reverse of that is obviously, if, it, if it's difficult to use, people will, will not use it as much. Other areas of, of, you know, if you start looking at technology though, who owns the customer, if everything's going through a particular mobility as a service app, how, where's that customer experience going to be coming from? If a customer has an issue, where are they going to be ringing? Um, so there's, there are other elements of this that we really must, uh, must look at. So to, to be successful, what should we be doing differently? And I think this is really summarizing. We really need to have very clear business objectives. We need to acknowledge that stakeholders will have their own motivations and work around those and with them to, to overcome those, identifying where the areas of, uh, of uh, compromise can be. But some of the other areas which are perhaps less identified in, in some of the other literature are things like change management and be behavioral change campaigns. Obviously, if we want to actually make a difference here and we want to get people out of their cars, they, they're going to have to have compelling reasons to do so. And some of that's going to come through some of those behavioral change campaigns. I also think one of the other areas is develop a transition plan. Most areas now are going to have systems already in place. There is going to take a period of time to actually transition from those existing systems to mobility as a service solution. Um, and we shouldn't underestimate that activity. And lastly on this, don't oversell the technology. The technology is, is great. It certainly helps provide the, the information required by, those, by the travelers, um, by the riders, uh, but it's only a small element of what really needs to be undertaken to actually make this successful. I'm just gonna quickly move on to autonomous vehicles. Um, and I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago relating to autonomous vehicles and the coming of age. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're all anticipating them coming. Um, the, the government announced in August this year that AVs would be on a road by 2025, but they didn't really identify what level of autonomy that really meant. And when you start looking at the levels, levels of autonomy, there are zero to six, as you can see from this, this screen here. Um, where zero being none and level level five, sorry, zero to five, I should say, I apologize, and level five being uh, fully autonomous, no driver required. But there is some confusion about level three and level four, um, as you can see here. What level three essentially says is that it will provide some assistance in um, certain situations, specifically on the strategic road network, um, in stop start type of, act, type of activities where where you're able to, where the car's able to essentially drive for a period of time um, without much driver input. Level four is quite the opposite, really. It's actually allowing the, the car to essentially drive completely on its own, except in adverse conditions. Uh, and what that really means is no, um, when, when you, the road striping is um, being obscured in some way, um, at that point you need to take over. But to be clear, both level three and level four do require, require a driver at the wheel to take over uh, um, as needed. Now, we all know that there are some, there's quite a lot of AV um, programs in testing at the moment. Um, we've got, we've got the, the, the fourth CAV, um, which Stoja Coach is running a bus across the, uh, um, the, the fourth bridge. Um, that's not driverless. That is a driver behind the wheel at the moment. Um, and actually, I really want to say that at this point in time, there are no level five autonomous vehicles on the roads today. Now, I hear what some of you are saying. Well, hold on a minute. We know what about the autonomous vehicles down in Heathrow, the pods? Well, that's a little different because they're in a controlled environment. They're not actually on the roads themselves. 
you know, then we've got the Abu Dhabi 15-seat uh, bus service, which is completely driverless. Yeah, that's, that is completely driverless, but it's still level four technology being used. Um, you've got about 30 AV um, trials going on in China at the moment in different cities in China. Um, they're also using autonomous three and autonomous four vehicles. But again, they're not really in urban or rural settings. They're actually being very tightly controlled where they are. <clears throat> and when you start looking at autonomous uh, level five, you're really looking at it should be able to be, be able to be utilized on the strategic road network as well as rural road, rural roads, local roads, uh, and urban roads. And at the moment, the I live in a very rural area. If we're in a situation where uh, I were to meet a car coming other in the other direction, I'd literally have to park myself halfway in a hedge for other vehicles to pass. And that's the kind of thing that at this point in time we don't have the ability to do with an autonomous vehicle. Then there's all, all, also the confusion around the business case. Why, why do we really need autonomous vehicles at this point in time? <clears throat> now, obviously, we can get people out of cars. That's going to solve one, one problem. But obviously, if we're just replacing the autonomous vehicles, the, the, the uh, um, congestion um, doesn't go away. If anything, it probably gets worse. So uh, where I'm coming from, from the business case point of view, is great movement. I think there's a, a very clear uh, opportunity around that. Public transport. I think demand responsive transport, particularly connecting rural communities with urban communities is, would be brilliant for, for um, autonomous vehicles. I just don't see it in the private car, but I'm willing to be told I'm wrong about that. And at that point, I'm going to uh, pass it back to Malcolm and ask if there's any questions. I'll stop sharing, Malcolm. Thank you, Jorgen. Uh, thanks for that. Um, some really interesting thoughts there. Um, on mobility as a service and cabs. Um, so we uh, there will be questions and we'll get on to them. I, I, we've got a few coming in already. Uh, so I'm going to hold them back because they're quite um, chunky ones rather than getting to them <laughs> right now. Um, but Jorgen has given us a definition there of mobility as a service uh, in his slide. So that would be interesting to hear in the chat and the comments uh, what others think about that, because I guess that's one of the challenges here is is the definition of what we're actually um, talking about. So I'd like to introduce now our uh, second guest today, uh, Steve Longman. I can see Steve's come on the screen. Welcome. Uh, Steve is uh, leading the development of the Breeze uh, platform for Solent Transport, uh, which ha has really pioneered the UK's first multi-city mobility as a service uh, application. Steve is a chartered uh, transport planner and qualified project manager. Uh, he focuses on future mobility and sustainable transport and has worked on various projects across the UK, Europe and Middle East and North Africa region as well. Um, so Steve's going to be speaking to us today uh, about delivering Solent's uh, mobility as a service. So welcome, Steve, uh, and over to you. Thanks, Malcolm. I'll just share my screen. Right. I'm assuming everyone can see this. Um, so to provide a little bit of context, I work for Solent Transport. Uh, we received funding as part of the, the Future Transport Zones program. Uh, we have two themes. Uh, the second theme is sustainable urban logistics. It's not the side I, I'm involved in, but we have drone trials, macro and micro consolidation. On the first theme, personal mobility, we've got uh, quite a few projects going on with our mobility as a service project sitting um, at the centre of that and sort of the jewel in the crown there. On the right hand side, um, just to provide further context, represents Southampton, Hampshire, Portsmouth and Isle of Wight councils. And then there's a rough outline of the area that we cover um, and that that includes the area that our Breeze app covers as well. Um, very quickly, um, in terms of the app side of things, our app contains sort of six main areas. The first area is an enhanced journey planner. So you're able to put in your origin destination, any waypoints along the way, and you're presented with some multimodal uh, travel options. That gives you an estimated travel time, an estimated cost, and coming soon, an estimated uh, impact on the environment. Uh, then you can drill down into those journeys so you can see further detail. 
we've got live travel information so you can track the, the bus or the ferry that's coming into port so you know um, that you can move to the bus stop you don't have to wait there you can wait in your workplace or if you're in the pub after work you can track that bus down to the, the sort of second coming into the stop uh, the second area is our ticket shop so um, you don't have to plan a journey you can go straight to the ticket shop uh, you can buy bus rail ferry tickets we've got our own um, multi-operator smart card called Solent Go um, where you've got your passes for micro mobility as well so when a user purchases a ticket or a pass that's where it sits and they can come back to it any time to use that um, the third area is our rewards and, and wallet function so that enables us to do promotions um, send out vouchers to users uh, users to make referrals etc but it's also where we can provide mobility credit as we've got uh, a trial um, to provide a, a certain demographic or user base with an amount of mobility credit uh, on a monthly basis and to trial how that affects their, their travel behavior. Um, the fourth area, we have a customer account. So this is where your, your trip history will be, your ID verification check will sit, any preferred payment cards and your trips, you'll be able to go over your history. And this is where all your information will sit. Um, we also have our, our payments modules, so we take Apple, uh, Google Pay, Visa and MasterCard. We have looked into Amex and PayPal, but they're, they're just too expensive uh, to, to include at the moment. And the sixth area is really important, uh, customer experience. So as you'll see in a few slides time, we've got uh, around about four mobility service providers. And if a customer has an issue, um, we found that uh, we need to get them to the right person as quickly as possible so we don't want them to have to speak to four people before they speak to the, the right person so for example if there's an issue with an e-scooter um, we've developed a, a support uh, system that takes them directly to our uh, e-mobility providers so they can sort that issue directly rather than a member of my team um, trying to put them in contact with the right person We've also got a customer relationship management software that we're, we're introducing at the moment that helps us drill down into customer behavior uh, and target really specific groups of people. So for example, it could be a bus route. Um, somebody's using a single ticket every day. So we could send them an email message saying, did you know you could buy this uh, weekly, monthly ticket and save X number of pounds? So you can really drill down into some detailed uh, analytics there. And then as, as we're going, we're making notes of what are the most, I don't know if the right term is most popular um, customer issues. So we can then write knowledge articles as we go. So um, we can provide that information up front uh, for people to, to help themselves essentially. Um, I do normally do a, a demo of the app when I'm presenting, but we've got limited time today. So what I will say is that um, go to your app store, if you search Breathe Journey, Journey Planner, you can download um, the app, uh, the version of the app that we currently released. At the moment, it is micro mobility focus um, with, uh, I think, about 50% of the bus services in our area. The Journey Planner does cover all services, but rail tickets, ferry tickets, um, car clubs, um, and some of the taxi services will appear over the next few weeks. Um, but you can play around and, and see what the app can do and the services that are included. A very quick timeline of uh, delivery. So we ordered the money back in 2020. It took a while, um, I mean, due to COVID and just actually getting this set up to uh, develop the procurement side of things and the tender and go out to the market to do that market engagement to really find out what, what we do need from a supplier. We appointed our, our partner Traffy back in quarter two, 21. We started to work with them on our MVP product. That was the only thing that was defined in detail in our, our bid, because um, we, we knew it was important to get up and running very quickly. So that enabled us to deliver our beta version of the app this time last year. We had our first multimodal journey that was paid for early in 22 in January. And then we, we undertook a dark launch 
Um, that meant that we released the app to our colleagues at the four individual local authorities for them to test, um, to provide feedback over a number of months, because we knew it was important to get the customer service and customer experience right, and we didn't want to release something that wasn't ready to go out to the public. Um, that led to a public launch in quarter three this year, and that was timed at the same time as our bike share project went live. So at the moment, um, the app is out there, people are using it to access our e-mobility services, as well as the bus services that I mentioned. Um, we are now gearing up for a full launch in January. This will be supported by a, a, an intensive marketing campaign and additional services. And that's when we turn to business as usual. Um, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, just to highlight the, the relationships um, that are involved. So Solent Transport sit at the, the center of our, our development. Uh, we've got Traffy as our, our main developer partner. Um, at the top right-hand corner there, we have the third party services that we've identified that we need. So payment services, ID verification, customer services, wallet and rewards. And we're currently, um, we have finalized our customer relationship management software. So I need to update my site. Um, but it was also worth pointing out at the bottom there, we've got, I think, 14 or 15 mobility service providers and trying to integrate them all at the same time has been quite a challenge. Um, some have different uh, requirements, some have uh, minimum requirements, and there's different levels of how we've integrated them. So that's been uh, quite a challenge over the last 12 months or so. And then just to highlight a really important part of developing Breeze, not just the app, but the wider service is our research partners. So we are working with University of Southampton, University of Portsmouth, and the Behavioral Insights team to really drill down into improving the app. So that might be routing options, it might be the colors we've used or the font we've used, or just general barriers to people using the app. Um, most of our integrations are level three at the moment in, in the FTZ period. Uh, it wasn't uh, a, an objective to move to level four um, just because we wanted to set something that was achievable. Uh, we are looking at ways to, to move to that level four, but I think it's important to get the uh, service up and running at level three to take the suppliers on that journey as well. Because I think as you said, the technology side thing, uh, sorry, the technology side of things is the easy part of this. It's the relationships and the commercial um, um, commercial agreements that are in place are, are sort of the hard thing to, to get right. So we found it's, it's to get up and running using tickets that are already there um, is, is the way to go and then build on that relationship once you're in that position. Very quick slide on managing data. Um, it's turned out this has been a huge chunk of my work over the last 12 months. Um, getting the, the data agreements in place, making sure that uh, policies and the agreements um, are all signed off before we did launch the public, making sure that's protected. This is a small, very small snapshot of the, the data mapping that we've done. So a tip here, if you're you're delivering your own mass services, don't underestimate the amount of work involved in managing the data and the legal agreements in the background. Um, as part of an objective of uh, trialing this at scale, we, we do have an eye on our business plan and our model. Um, what I'm presenting here on screen isn't our business plan or our model, so um, don't read anything into these lines, it's just an illustration but we are tracking um, a number of different scenarios um, because we have to uh, monitor this very closely because it's ever changing. And it's now getting to the point where we're moving to business as usual. We're making business decisions based on the, the revenue that's coming in. Um, so I don't know the answer to what is the best business model formats um, because that's that's the point of our trial we're trying to work that out and try different things as, as we're going um, and just to slide on continuous improvement um, come january when we do this uh, enhanced launch of the app that will represent the the core version of the service 
and then we move to continuing the developing, looking at the research, looking at the feedback we're getting from users uh, and putting that back into the app. Um, and then very final slide, um, just some emerging lessons learned from our team. So speed and agility um, is really important. We got up to speed quickly. Um, the future transport zone is the time limited project. So we thought it was important to, to get up and running early, which is why we, we've opted to sell tickets that already exist and then expand on those later. Um, we identified quite early on that software as a service was the right way to go in terms of providing the, the app infrastructure and platform. In terms of expertise and resources, I don't think anyone's got all the expertise all in one place. Um, we've had to ramp up the resources that that have been working on the project and with different teams, uh, different skills. Um, I, I don't think we're, we're there yet, but we're, we're, we're definitely um, on, on track to get the right people on, in the right positions to, to deliver the app once we do go live. Um, tickets and new features. I think the, the tactic for us has been to excel existing tickets that are currently exist and then work on those new products going forward with our MSPs once they're comfortable with the application. Um, and then in terms of new features, it's managing expectations. As York said, everyone's got an opinion on what MAS is or what MAS should include. But again, we've got limited development budget and a timeline there to, to really focus on, on what's needed. What's an emerging lesson um, that I, I think is, is trust with the user. It's presenting accurate data, but also being able to um, protect their data as well. We're not, we're not in the business of selling the data on, it's protected um, and we want to uh, provide a sort of personal assistance service that's trusted by the user. So I'll, I'll leave that there and come back to questions uh, in the question session. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. There's a lot, an awful lot in that. And I'm sure there'll be uh, some questions uh, that come through around um, some of the, the challenges of, of putting a platform like that together. So let's let's move on to our third uh, speaker today. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to welcome Nick Reed. Uh, Nick is the founder at Reed Mobility. Uh, he's also the uh, a chief road safety advisor at National Highways. Nick has led uh, CAV research for TRL uh, over many years and was also the head of mobility R&D uh, at Bosch before uh, setting up Read Mobility. Nick has worked on a wide range of, of projects spanning public, private uh, and academic sectors. He's an advisor on investment and strategy decisions as well as policy and resource uh, allocation. So it's a great pleasure to have Nick uh, with us today. He's going to be talking um, about a safe, safe ethical and responsible transition uh, towards connected and automated mobility. So over to you, Nick. Thank you very much, Malcolm. And, and indeed, thank you to, to Sistra and, and Landor for, for setting up this session and inviting me to participate. I'll just share my slides. Hopefully you can see that. And I'm going to start with um, uh, apologies to Jorgen, a slight correction to his, uh, to his introduction on cows. Um, he talked about the, the levels of automation. So level three is level zero, level one, level two. They're vehicles that are available today. They have assistance, driver assistance systems. Level three is where you can hand control of the driving task over to uh, the, the system itself. But you need to be ready to come back into the loop to take over control when the system requires it. Now, these systems are just about coming onto the market. They're available in Germany and, and likely to be available in the UK. Um, next year. Some questions there about that whole process of handing over control and it being handed back to the drivers, of course. Um, level four is where the vehicle is capable of doing all the driving in specific conditions. So the pods uh, Jorgen mentioned at Heathrow, they are level four automated vehicles. They don't have a steering wheel, they don't have any controls within the vehicle, but they only operate within that very tight, tightly constrained system. Now, you can also have a level four vehicle that looks like a regular car, but it will do all the driving for you only within a certain geographical area or a certain type of road, for example, highways. Um, and then the driver is required for any other 
driving um, outside of those tight constraints, but it doesn't necessarily need a driver if it's only operating within that constrained environment. And then level five is where the vehicle can do all the driving whenever you want uh, to the same standard as a human driver, or hopefully better than a, than a human driver. That does not exist. I don't think anyone is working on a vehicle that is capable of, of doing level five driving. So level four and, and level, level three and level four are where things get interesting and where such vehicles can start to contribute to mobility as a service, particularly level uh, four. So I'm going to start at my presentation. And um, it's interesting that we're, I, I, I've started to call it Schrodinger's cab. The automated vehicle industry seems to be simultaneously dead and alive at the same time. So recently there, there was the announcement that uh, Argo AI, a very well-funded developer of automated vehicles was, was closing. It had been had huge backing from Ford and Volkswagen. And I think what this, you know, in some ways this is encouraging, but because I think what this reflects is that um, automated vehicles haven't lived up to the hype. They haven't lived up to the, the hype that was going around five, six years ago. And the companies that have invested aren't getting the returns on the investment that they were expecting. So they're having to, to claw back um, what they can. And folk, you know, the likes of Ford and VW are very focused on um, electrification rather than automation. Yet at the same time, there's still very good progress. So if you go to Phoenix, you can now, using an app, summon a vehicle like the one shown on screen, um, which will have no driver. It can participate in regular traffic and can take you from your origin to your destination within a certain defined area of the city. Now, so that, that, that exists today. Other companies are, are working on similar projects, some related to deliveries, some related to passenger movement. These things are starting to become a reality. So we, we should be thinking about how should such vehicles start to fit into mobility as a service propositions. Now, the, 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 co the topic of, of my presentation today is about the safety and ethics of automated vehicles. And I'm going to talk about some work I did for the European Commission, where I was one of a panel of experts to come up with recommendations on the, um, the ethics of connected and automated vehicles. It's, it's very easily accessible online. Um, we came up with 20 recommendations split into three different categories. So there were six on safety, nine on transparency and five on responsibility. Um, and I, I was in the subgroup focused on safety. So I'm going to talk about some of the key recommendations that emerged from that safety group. So the first uh, recommendation that I'm going to talk about was recommendation four, which is about rules. Um, we recognize that uh, a, an automated vehicle should comply with the, the driving rules, but there might be some situations where uh, it would be safer for the automated vehicle to um, not comply with the rules. For example, um, there's a double white line in the center of the road, and in order to avoid a collision, the vehicle has to swerve um, across the double white line to avoid a collision. Now, uh, it's very difficult for an automated vehicle to determine when it might be appropriate to break the rules of the road. So how should an automated vehicle manage this? Should we change the rules? Well, that's that's very difficult to start thinking about all of the infinite um, variety that a, a vehicle might encounter out on the roads and come up with rules to, to manage that. Could you hand control back to a, a human driver in a either at the wheel or, or in a remote control center? Well, again, we've got those issues about that transition of control, can that be done in a timely manner? Can it be done in a safe manner? Or could we allow the automated vehicles not to comply? And I think that's where we were headed, that you would require the vehicle to have an audit trail as to why it chose to break the rules at that specific time in the interests of safety. And if a judge then thinks that was the wrong thing to do, the um, company responsible for the automated vehicle can be, um, can, be, can be blamed, can be held liable in that situation. And, and we would, improve and improve and improve on the safety of these vehicles. Um, and we felt that the, what's required are these ethical goal functions. And what an ethical goal function is, is an attempt to capture the interests of society in how automated vehicles and indeed any transport technologies should operate. And we think this, an ethical goal function could be, could encapsulate 
people's expectations of how automated vehicles should operate, you know, their, how they should behave in response to pedestrians and cyclists and protecting vulnerable road users. We think this is really important. It can be tailored by location. So the UK might have a different ethical goal function to Italy or Greece or Brazil or India. Um, and they, these ethical goal functions would tailor how automated vehicles would operate. And there would be a, a process by which society could input into the design of those ethical goal functions. And that's a project I'm working on right now is, is to understand how we can capture the interests of society and feed those into how we expect automated vehicles and, and services based on automated vehicles to behave. Then we also talked about um, recommendations related to harm and uh, vulnerability. Now, uh, for in reducing harm, we said, as I'm sure you would expect, uh, automated vehicles should be at least as safe as human drivers, at least as safe. So the introduction of automated vehicles should not uh, increase the risk of harm. That's the, that's the baseline expectation. Not only that, that even if there was a reduction in harm, they should not be responsible for an increase in harm to any category of road users. So even if there was a big reduction in injuries to vehicle occupants, there should be no increase in risk to, uh, for example, pedestrians or cyclists, horse riders, motorcyclists, you know, these specific categories we can identify should not experience an increased risk of harm by the introduction of automated vehicles. I felt that was, that was very important, but we need the data to be able to understand if that is, is really happening. Um, uh, and how risk is distributed across those categories. And then lastly, when people talk about ethics of automated vehicles, they often talk about these uh, dilemmas, these trolley problems. Should the vehicle swerve left, hitting a mother and pushchair or swerve right, uh, killing uh, a, an older pedestrian or something? You know, so, some, some of these weird dilemma situations uh, that are discussed. Now, we felt those dilemmas don't really add much to the, our understanding of how automated vehicles should behave. An automated vehicle, you know, it, it's a continuous process. It's continually balancing a number of different objectives, a number of different risks. And what we should be doing is making sure at all moments, it is appropriately balancing those risks. And if you, can, if you genuinely had one of these dilemma situations and you could look back through time and say, were all the decisions the automated vehicle made in arriving at that dilemma point correct? And did it act appropriately on arriving at that dilemma situation? Did it do all that it possibly could to avoid um, the worst outcomes? Then that would be considered ethical behavior. So again, so it's kind of unpicking how we might be able to solve those dilemma situations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, all of those things I've just described depend on collecting data from automated vehicles and we need that data to be accurate it needs to be a true representation of what the vehicle was seeing and doing it needs to be standardized so we can make comparisons between manufacturer a and manufacturer b and how their vehicles operate it needs to be comprehensive so we have a full picture um, of uh, a full understanding of, of how the vehicle was behaving and it needs to be shared not necessarily shared with everyone but shared at least with a regulator who can decide whether the vehicle is behaving in a safe and ethical manner. And what we've come up with um, in work that I've been doing for uh, BSI, British Standards Institution, is a concept called digital commentary driving, which is where um, automated vehicle manufacturers would be required to share a standardized format of, of data around what their vehicles are doing. Now, we think that's a reasonable thing to ask because all vehicles should be calculating you know, what things are they seeing, how should they be acting? How are they going to respond to achieve their objectives of getting to their destination safely? So sharing that data shouldn't compromise their IP, but it should give us um, some confidence that what the vehicles are doing is safe, is a, a reasonable approach to interacting in complex environments here, starting to operate in, in towns and cities in a manner that is safe, in a manner that is um, in line with the expectations of the communities that these vehicles are intended to serve. So what we need is that industry standard on how we collect data from automated vehicles. We need the, the protocols for sharing that data with a regulator and, and giving that regulator the tools to, to manage how um, those the, the vehicle operators are behaving. 
We need clarity over the ethical behavior of automated vehicles so that the manufacturers themselves can start to create vehicles that operate in the way society expects. And then we need that process of collecting um, the, uh, the, the expectations of the communities where, that are gonna be affected by the deployment of these vehicles. We want them to be able to input into how automated vehicles should behave, how the services based on automated vehicles should operate to make sure that the vehicles truly do serve those communities and don't impinge on them in, in ways that we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't want. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a, a really exciting time. I think we're starting to get to the, uh, the, the point where automated vehicles can start to make a practical difference in our lives. It's gonna be a long process. Um, but it's exciting. It's good to see that the, you know, this sort of work is, is defining ways to make sure that happens both safely and ethically. So I, I'll stop there and uh, really looking forward to the discussion and, and thinking about how automated vehicles can really contribute to mobility as a service. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, for that. Lots uh, to think about there, and we'll certainly have uh, plenty of questions and um uh, discussion on it as we go. So just a quick reminder before I introduce our, our final guest today, uh, if you do have questions, and thank you to those who sent those them in already, please put them in the Q&A section as opposed to the chat, uh, just to make sure that we can we can pick them up there. So finally, I'd like to introduce Bieta Kubitz, uh, who is a transport consultant um, with experience in future mobility, uh, and particularly in the role that it plays in carbon reduction Bieta has developed uh, plans for mobility as a service and mobility hubs in the UK, uh, including the Leeds City Region Future Mobility Strategy. Her research and policy development work includes uh, the impact of rural and peri-urban mobility on city centre traffic, uh, demand responsive tr uh, transport and e-cargo uh, bike logistics trials. So it's great to have Bieta with us today. I look forward to her uh, presentation uh, which is going to be about how future mobility uh, options offer a reliable and realistic alternative to the private car. So over to you, Beata. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Beata Hewitt, and I'm going to be talking about future mobility options. Um, and by those, I mean things like um, data and technology, maps. I think we've got a lot of the technology to digitise maps, to plan journeys, um, to create service information, to manage payments, and all of those together can be in various different forms and configurations bundled as um, mobility as a service. Um, we have also got infrastructure and vehicles coming forward in future mobility. And I think the one thing that um, I worry about a lot when we talk about future mobilities, we tend to focus on the vehicles and forget about the um, pavements, the cycle lanes, um, the bus lanes and the tracks. And it's both having those and also having those digitized so that we have the information about pavements, the information about cycle lanes so that we can wrap those into maps and journey planners, um, service information um, and create um, a really comprehensive amount of information, um, as well as having the infrastructure there um, for people to increase their active trans travel as part of future mobility. And when we when we bundle these things together, we then have the option to create shared bikes, bike share systems, um, car clubs, lift sharing, um, sharing vehicles so that we maximise the utilisation of vehicles through digitisation and putting things on platforms. Um, and then we can also create shared services like um, lift sharing, um, on-demand buses, um, and without losing out on public transport on the bus and rail, which forms the core of most mobility as a service um, uh, uh, services, which are in existence. Existence. And I think this is um, where I kind of want to talk about two things we need to solve and one we don't, um, because this mobility as a service, where it's working already um, on continental Europe, it's just kind of becoming the way people do transport. Um, and in continental Europe, the business model around um, uh, transport provision is very much built around public, so public transport services which work and which then integrate shared services into them. And I think we have a, outside of London, we have a, a, a serious issue that we have, we, we lack some of the capability to truly integrate operations, um, bus and rail, um, different bus operators, different bus services, different ticketing systems, different payment for, um, provision, and create really good value public transport 
into which um, so, uh, shared services are integrated. So business models are an issue. And, I, and, and uh, Steve was saying earlier that technology is, is the easiest thing. I absolutely agree. We have most of what we need to create mobility as a service technologically. We don't have the business models yet in the UK. Um, we also have a problem in the structure of our um, transport system and how city, cities are already moving away from the car. We, we drive almost, if you live within a city, um, you drive almost half of, as much as someone who lives in a rural or area with a kind of sliding scale of the amount of the distance that you travel and the distances by car um, between the urban and the rural. And this is where, where we really see the problem with mobility as a service, and I'm a great advocate for it. So I think it's a problem we need to solve, not a problem that we should just hold our hands up uh, um, uh, on. Um, we can see here Manchester, which is uh, what, what I've been looking at. And you can see this sort of north south, uh, um, south to west um, access. Um, that is the core of the city of Manchester. It's got about 600,000 people out of the 2.2 million people who will live within the whole of the urban area. Um, and it has the best transport within Manchester. Once you get beyond that core, um, you have much less good transport and you only have these little nuggets and in surrounding areas of really good transport, by which I mean the darker red colours on the map. Beyond that, I've interviewed lots of people. And if you're looking at the yellow and the green and, and the orange, then that's just not good enough transport as far as their lived experience is concerned. So the best, the most jobs and uh, the lowest people driving to work all live in this sort of like southern axis that you can see on the map to Manchester. If you also lay this map over where people own cars and how often and how far they drive, um, then you can see that this cut this um, area, the central Manchester core, really corresponds with people who drive less and own fewer cars. And the data here is from Carbon Dot Place, which I cannot advocate enough as a really good way of seeing um, visualizing um, carbon intensity through transport and other um, uh, you know, uh, parts of people's lives. So um, outside of the urban core, we have this issue that people are both using cars and they are driving for further. So even though there are fewer people um, or less dense, people drive much more, much greater distances. And the net in consequence of this is that the borough of Manchester has, um, it has, uh, despite having the lowest number of car drivers, it has a huge number of cars converging from those outer areas into that central core. So however good the transport is within the centre of Manchester, um, you know, it has tra trams, there are buses, um, there's a bike share scheme. Um, that's great, but there are still all of these people coming from outside. And just because they look like they're less dense and there are fewer of them per borough, by the time they've converged, um, you've got 75% uh, of the transport traffic coming, arriving in the centre of Manchester um, is, is derived from outside of that zone. And it, it adds enormously to the um, congestion and the air quality in that city. And this is not um, uh, just a UK problem. I, I, it, it happens everywhere that we have seen um, that where the urban core is being sorted out in terms of transport, um, where there's really dense provision um, and good quality transport, where there's active travel being um, instigated, like for instance, in the centre of Paris, Mayor Hidalgo has done an amazing job of um, changing the centre of Paris beyond recognition in many respects, pedestrianising, creating the cycle pieces, um, she is hated outside the peripherique because all those people who used to be able to drive from the outlying Ile-de-France areas were, were no longer able to do that in the way that they were used to. And this is a, it, it's become a battle. Um, it, it means also that um, within France we have a lot of uh, in, it, people working on the Ile de France on some of these solutions that I'm going to be talking about very briefly because I know we're quite short of time. Um, I can't start, uh, I can't emphasise active travel enough in this instance and I can't sort of uh, uh, emphasise that we have really fallen behind in providing pavements. Um, the pictures here are semi-rural areas in North Manchester we need to move from uh, north of Manchester, sorry. Um, we need to move from the picture on the top where you've got a school which has no pavements um, and, and a population surrounding it, which can, if you're a hesitant parent, you don't make your child walk across along that pavement. It's a 30 to 40 mile an hour road, uh, the, sorry, a pavementless road for 30 to 40 miles an hour. Um, 
with cars coming down, it, it just becomes sort of um, inaccessible due to safety reasons. And, and we have this is repeated over and over again outside of city centres. We've forgotten these areas, and that that's some, one of the things that promotes car use, cycleways, ditto, and, and traffic calming. Because we've got this air situation where we have a national speed limit. Rural roads are sixty miles an hour because they're national speed limit roads. So they don't really take traffic at sixty miles an hour. Um, so we need we need some real kind of like rethinking of how we um, improve uh, the access to active travel outside of um, city centres. But it is good for our environment. When we do these things, we create better communities. Um, here is a community project, cargo bikes in, in the same area that without the pavements. Um, we have car clubs outside of rural areas, outside of urban areas. It does mean that um, the, the wisdom is that everything um, concentrated in the city will work better. It's not necessarily true. And it's, it's always good to see um, business models emerging outside of these areas, because this is where we need to tackle car use. Innovative public transport is the instance here. Um, the low frequency services, which, we, which we've fallen to outside of um, the city core, is um, not good enough for people to want to use the bus. And that's where we're seeing DRT being really successful in areas where the bus, on-demand buses can link people into good service, into services and um, stations and um, rapid transit networks. And we see um, where we see really good and interesting DRT. We see um, young people starting to use buses again to get to college when they weren't able to do so before when they were dependent on lifts and there's some really good examples like the hearts links in Hertfordshire which is showing great promise for getting a different demographic onto the bus. Um, at the end of the day this means that we get much nicer places and I think sometimes we think in the UK we can't have nice things but we need to keep that in mind that if we can do these things which are more about how we provide transport not just how we link it together then that's a great thing. Um, without ever um, forgetting um, that we need to fix these business models to ensure that people feel that when they get on the bus they get the best value they're going to get a really good service um, and it's going to connect them um, and without that mobility as a service won't work wherever I, I do a lot of research into continental Europe and it's always built around bus and train and that's what really works so that's my my very rapid summary of mobility as a service when it comes to automated vehicles, I think we can also see um, that that has a really, um, we see the first DRT automated vehicles in, launched in Europe, in, in um, France particularly, where they're linking outside um, urban areas into the core. And that's one of the things that I really think we ought to look at, having listened to Nick and, um, and uh, Jorgen and Steve. So thank you very much for listening to me and um, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Beata. That was, again, another really interesting presentation. So there's a, a lot of content there. There's so much that we could explore and talk about in this uh, next half hour. Um, yeah, if I could welcome the speakers back, if you want to just pop your, your videos and, and microphones on. I will try and direct questions towards individuals, but if anyone wants to jump in uh, and, and respond, then please do. I think that, you know, one of the interesting things that I've picked up a theme throughout the session has has been it's not about the technology but it's about lots of other aspects as well uh and so i just want to sort of pick up on that to to kick off the questions and and really ask i suppose um about the, the term mass mobility as a service uh, and using that term and do we tend to associate it with the use of technology and do we have a broad enough appreciation of everything that that can involve so there's a question that was sent in in advance um, of this, and I'll maybe come to you, Jorgen, uh, as you've been silent for a little while um, on this one. But the question was, what standards need to be met to actually be able to call a transport system a mass network? Is it accessibility, journey quality, frequency, speed? What are the what are the metrics and uh, that should be used in in the evaluation? Any thoughts on that? In addition to your presentation. I think, uh, thank you for that. I, I think that's one of the problems at the moment. And one of the reasons I think uh, the concepts around mobility as a service are being oversold. I don't think there is any definition around it. Um, and I think it's up to us to actually start forming those, those, those that criteria. I, I do think, however, it does, it will change. Um, it, uh, mobility as a service is very much a case of, you know, it has to 
has to go in line with what's available in your area, has to go around uh, in line with social demographics, uh, affordability, um, and so many other things as well. Um, from my point of view, I think we should be coming up with a better term than mobility as a service. And I think there was a, a question sent in advance relating to that as well. Um, but it really, it really needs to be more related to integrated accessible uh, accessibility for for everybody. Um, and I, I saw there was another uh, question related to is it for as many people as possible or is it for everybody? It should be for everybody. Our goal is to to ensure that uh, mobility becomes almost like um, a right for free healthcare. Uh, I'm not suggesting it should be free, but it should be it should be made available um, and accessible to everybody. But um, yeah. I hope this answered the question. If it hasn't, please come back to me. Well, I think just picking up on that accessibility thing, because that is something that's come through in the chat and, and the yeah. questions today. Um, there, there have been questions around the use of apps and, uh, you know, is uh, and, the, and I suppose just the use of technology in general. And maybe I'll come to you with this one, Steve. But um, in terms of uh, being able to use apps is, is one aspect of is is the service accessible. But also then there's um, uh, everything that goes, you know, that that the app does, all the different options that it provides, how accessible are they? Um, so, Steve, is that something that you, in your work and developing the Breeze platform, is that something that you picked up on as you as you went through that development and any thoughts on, on accessibility to the users? It's, uh, yes, of course, and it's a very important question. Um, I guess there's there's two sides to our the, the breeze service. There's the front end app that um, is the the main focal point and engagement uh, tool. But then there's also the the back office and the back end development. So starting off with the the front end, um, we we do work with our university and research partners um, to make and design the app so it's, it's accessible. As possible. So, for example, the the font that we've used, the colours that we've used, have all been checked and analysed to make sure they're accessible to everyone. Personally, I'm colourblind, and when we were developing the the marketing, sorry, the the branding of our app and the colours used within the apps, there were some buttons that I couldn't tell apart or or couldn't um, or didn't know. You pressed one, or one was greyed out because they were so similar. Um, in terms of, I guess, user preferences, people are able to um, select which services that they they want to use, or if they've got a particular need for using that service. So, if they need um, the, the extra legroom seats or the disabled speak seats, they can select that. Um, so it shows in the journey planner. Um, in terms of uh ensuring accessibility our, our app can be used i think it's up to five or six years old in terms of operating systems so it's it's a, it's a wide range of phones and devices that can use the app um in terms of people who who are not uh up to speed with using apps or who, who don't have access to devices, that's where the, the back office can come in. The relationships and the platforms and the connections that we're making now bring together this service that, um, for example, a parent could have an account uh, and a child could have a token that, that you be able to scan on the service, but the parent manages the, the account within the app. Um, and that could apply to, to lots of different uh, relationships. So in terms of accessibility, it is at the core of, of what we're doing and the work we're doing. It's, it's not just about having a nice shiny app. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we're doing so much research to, to, to sort of inform that. And that's where the interesting part comes next year, where we've now got that core app in place. Um, and the, the work research the universities are doing are feeding into that development. Yeah. And just just to to continue on the on the sort of theme of that the breeze platform and what you what you've developed there a couple of questions are coming in and again it's that kind of idea that, that the technology is not the challenging thing but around the the sort of procurement and legal process involved in mobility as a service and maybe particularly from the the, the public sector or local authority perspective what were the challenges and uh that you came across in that and how you know might you 
overcome those. Sure. Um, it, I must say, it's been very challenging, the, the procurement side of things. Uh, we, we can't be as agile as maybe a startup uh, company that would be delivering this, this sort of app in the private sector. Um, in terms of what I would do differently, it, was, it would be to go out and have market engagement at a much earlier stage mm. and, and start that process. Um, there have been items which, even during our, our bid for the funding, we didn't know that we needed. For example, ID verification, um, that, that isn't in our original uh, roadmap or plan. We, mm. we assumed that was part of the, the, the platform. So then we had to go out, I think it was about a two month process from start to finish of awarding um, or identifying that, that provider. Um, but that meant that we couldn't then launch for two months. So procurement has been very challenging, um, but it's, it's really sitting down at the beginning and um, trying to plot out what you do need um, and who you need to speak to. Hmm. Thanks for that. I'm sure there's there's probably several people on the call from what I can pick up who would <laughs> uh, be interested in in your insights on that, and I'm sure they'll get in touch uh, to yeah, follow please, up on that. Please do get in touch. Um, Nick, just to come to come to you, we we you, you, your session was on autonomous vehicles, and you talked quite a bit about the, the kind of the technology and how and some of the ethical decision making that goes on and how to um uh how, how that can progress how how do you see it fitting into this the other things that we've heard about today where we're looking at you know various modes and and ways of movement and, and mobility as a service how do you think the autonomous vehicles would you know could fit into that framework yeah thanks mark well i think it, it depends it depends what they're capable of of doing and whether they work in ways that people want um i know when uh it was claire perry was the the mp at the time who was launching uh one of the automated vehicle projects or a consultation or a competition or something um but she was interested in them from a pers the perspective of her rural constituency where you know there is one bus per day or something and and the the opportunity to provide mobility with an on-demand service using an automated vehicle rather you know, that, uh, that is tailored to be the right size for the, the level of demand that it would um, encounter. Um, it sounds, sounds like quite a, an interesting proposition, whether it would actually work, whether it actually could, could actually deal with the rural roads that it might encounter and the, the obstructions it might face on those types of roads. That's, that's kind of to, to be determined. And, um, you know, when we, we're talking about these, these level four automated vehicles, ones that can operate without a human at the controls, um, they need to be able to deal with all the things that they might encounter within their, their operating domain. Um, and you'll note there that I said without a human at the controls, but not necessarily without a human on board. So we could, if that's how we want the service to operate, we could have services where um, rather than a driver, there's like a a host, you know, like the, back to the, having the, the, the conductors um, whose role might be specifically around uh, passenger welfare rather than having to drive the vehicle. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's it's for us to determine, you know, what, what services do we want and, and how can we make them fit into the mobility requirements of the, the communities where they operate? And then one final point, Malcolm, is, is a lot of the companies working on this technology are adjusting their business model to work on um, delivery vehicles rather than passenger vehicles. So I think mm -hmm. there is um, an important role there for um, access to, to deliveries and, and how we manage the movement of goods on the road network and automated vehicles might help to improve, um, streamline that process. Yeah. So get that. Yeah, that's not something we've talked a huge amount about today is delivery vehicles or freight, but that I can see how that could, could be a, a sort of gateway in for autonomous vehicles there's also also something that's come up with questions around autonomous buses and i know we've talked a little bit about um the demand response of transport um 
there do seem to be some examples of autonomous buses in in Europe. I think Beata, was it you that mentioned mentioned that? Is that another potential uh, way in for autonomous vehicles uh, into this mobility as a service market? Yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of the companies working on this have these, you know, broadly car sized um, bus buses that can carry ten to twelve um, passengers. Um, and with the thought that you know you could op operate multiple of those um, in a city and have a, 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 a an efficient service, um, serving only specific locations. So as I said, like, this is level four automation. It's within you know say three miles of the central train station. You might have this um, automated bus service that means that people don't need to drive to the station in the morning, that they have this on-demand service, it's reliable, it's predictable, it's, um, it operates you know, in that on-demand manner, it's, it should be comfortable and um, pleasant to ride in, um, and can hopefully you know, reduce the need for um, station parking and all of the congestion that goes on, that goes along with that. Mm. Um, now, we're, we don't have uh, good examples of those um, operating in practice yet. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is kind of a, an open question as to whether they, they can be made to work in a way that is commercially viable. But there's certainly plenty of organisations working on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have had one of our um, uh, participants today had a, had a per experience on an autonomous bus, apparently. So um, he was interested to know if anyone on the panel has actually been on on one uh, I'll be yes yeah, I have and, and yeah, yeah it's it's early technology it needs it yeah. needs more work for sure yeah yeah there, there are a number of there are a number of um uh pilots going on around the world though particularly for passenger transport as well as for for freight movement um and, and certainly the delivery movement as well is being investigated in a, in a, in, a, in a high degree um I, I I I can't agree more with Nick I think it's coming, but we're not there yet. But let's put it that way. Um, you know, I think there's there's a lot more work to be done, both from a level four point of view, and there are some level four autonomous vehicles destined to hit the market next year in the UK market, is my understanding. Um, I believe uh, Hyundai and Mercedes both have ones ready to come out at this point in time. But again, what does that really mean? Um, you know, are they able to accommodate the rural roads? From my point of view, um, from a from a transport, um, uh, so for a person who's interested in transport, DRT is one of the areas I really want to see and want to start seeing trials going, uh, starting to happen as quickly as possible. But again, when the when the technology is ready, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, I think you're completely right. I think the most exciting uh, um, AV trial that I've seen was in a little um, in the Ile de France outside of Paris, uh, connecting an out of town station with um, a college and a number of, and, a, and a housing development. And that it is probably the least exciting, sexy from a lot of points of view, because, you know, it's just a stretch of rural road about three kilometres long. <laughs> It's really not kind of like there are no flashing lights, whizzing bangs or lasers, um, but actually being able to connect that um, to infrequent passenger flows and numbers yeah. is is um, at a kind of cost that could make it accessible to that community is far more exciting to me than something that go, well, go, travels around the city centres. We've got enough cars yeah. in city centres. We've got right. a lot of forms of transport in city centres. Yeah. And, and Malcolm, just a very quick point. Uh, something Roger's raised in the chat. Um, one of the concerns about these vehicles isn't just safety, as in will they crash into things, but safety of occupants if there is no attendant on board. Um, so how can we make sure people feel safe and are, are, you know, are safe and feel safe in such vehicles if there is no um, staff member on board? That's, a, 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 again, another open question. Mm, yeah. Now, we've mentioned um, rural roads a couple of times there. and. There have been a couple, few questions come in around uh, the sort of urban and rural dilemma. I think, um, Bieta, this is an area that you've worked in, so maybe I'll direct this one to you initially, but uh, someone's written, should future mobility concepts be delivered as a city-specific or regional concept packages, um, or would a general approach work? Curious to understand theory and practicality 
in establishing such a service. So how you you kind of raised the question with your presentation. What, what's the solution? It's all my own fault. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I'm it's interesting seeing what's going on in other countries at the moment on this, because it is it is something that people are noticing. Um, in Paris and the Ile de France is definitely one of these areas and, and some of the, the autonomous vehicle DRT services that have been trialled there. Um, there's a lot more um, interest in DRT just to connect people who are in less dense areas into stations and rapid transit networks in just partly because France actually has a law that says you have an access, you have a right to access to mobility. So all of the areas that have traditionally been quite car focused have said, actually, we need to make sure that people who don't have cars have an, have, have are able to take up this right um, as legally enshrined in, in France. And, we'll, and we see a lot of on-demand transport um, with that, both people trialling AV through like platforms um, and uh, not. And then the other the other thing um, that's interesting, and because uh, that's not about a reform of the structure of the central Paris versus the surrounding area. But one of the things that I found quite interesting in Germany is that in Germany you have um, communes that are starting just to band together. They realize that an, an individual smaller out of town commune is never going to be able to afford or justify a bike share system on its own, but they are taking a number of different communities and, and the mayors, we, we, this is this is a, an element of that we don't have in the UK, this sort of mayoral system where each, quite small area could have a mayor and the mayors talk to each other and say right okay we need to get together and create a network uh, transport system for e-bike share for instance and um, mobility hubs we need to have a network of mobility hubs and it's no good just having one in Oberhausen when we need one in, in um, Stecknada or wherever that's down the road from it, it you know there's 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 a realization that you can that transport is about going from place to place so you've got to involve your com the communities around you um, and so we're seeing mayor, mayors and their zones or areas banding together and jointly procuring mobility services mobility hubs um, electric bike share all sorts of things um, and I, I think I find that really exciting that it's becoming that, that this is sort of a, a, a potential model that we could even look at in the UK obviously we need some mayors first but you know and on, on the just on the sort of the commercial side of that because we are getting a few comments and questions in around um, the commercial viability of some of these services and so in France you're saying that they it, it's um, it's the legal position that's accessible and needs to be offered. And is that what is that what is driving the provision of the services then? Yeah. So, so there is. I think we also need to look at different ways of funding things. So in France, actually, transport is largely funded through a payroll tax. So that wherever you have a, um, a a metropolitan area of some kind, the companies within that will contribute a um, a payroll related related surcharge effectively to funding transport within that area. So that money then goes into funding people's access to mobility. Um, so. It, when you say commercial viability, there is not an expectation that bus companies will earn a fortune or, you know, that they have to be profitable. They just have to fall within the cost envelope of fares plus advertising plus this um, employer tax that, um, that all the commune decides to contribute because they think it's a good thing that people have buses and travel by bus. So, how, so someone, um, I think Gary here has raised that in uh that some of the drt schemes in scotland which have started you know because of funding and being support for periods of time have not lasted as commercial operations so that whole question of commercial viability is an interesting one and i also want to tie that in with um in general the the fact that we're you know we're going into a cost of living crisis uh the financial viability of of any of the measures we're, we're discussing today, um, the question here is, can I ask the panel how they think uh, that, um, you know, councils and, and uh, are going to be able to offer these kind of services uh, with, with budget cuts coming up? So any thoughts on how we, how we move so, through next season? So I think the whole issue in transport in the UK is that we have created a commercial model where by the route, the routes and branches of, you know, are 
are commercially viable, but the, the trees, the capillaries, the tiny, the small bits that come, connect into that are not. And until we kind of basically rethink that model, we're always going to have this problem of um, commercial viability, um, where we expect somehow um, it to be fine to run commercially profit making rapid transit routes, the, the bus corridors that work with peak flows of um, uh, passengers uh, sort of effectively cross subsidizing off peak times and I mean we've we've We've, we're in two two eyes of two storms in the moment because on the one hand we have cuts for, um, and the cost of living crisis and we also have changing patterns in passenger numbers. Our, our peak, peakiness has stopped in very many um, uh, services since COVID as people's working patterns have changed. There's been a kind of lasting, there's been an increase in leisure travel by public transport and rail um, mm -hmm. and and uh, and a decrease in commuting, peak commuting. So I, I think there's a, a whole question about, we were probably in the UK need to sit down and think, do we, this, this commercial model that's been developed since the 80s it worked for a certain amount of time but it's it's probably not working now and making it a, a composite of um tiny feeder systems which have to which by their very definition not commercially viable because you just don't have the density of people on those routes um and commercially viable routes which have high peak transport high peak fares that kind of keep the rest of the route running for the rest of the day it needs rethinking um, and in the cost of living crisis um, it's really interesting uh, some of the very local work that we do with community transport providers providing DRT is that this is an absolute lifeline for people yeah. who are facing the cost of living crisis so it's it's worth supporting because otherwise areas are going to be people are going to become economically um, and uh, disconnected and disenfranchised even more so if we can't provide some kind of French style access to mobility she says sounding like she's speaking from the Republic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually, Jorgen, yes. Yeah, can I? I agree with everything that uh, Theatre has just uh, just articulated. Um, what it depends on what, what problem we're trying to solve, or which problems we're trying to solve as well. If we're trying to solve um, the problem of carbon um, and and get back to the decarbonisation um, approach, then we have really no choice but to start investing in some of these um, other uh, transport opportunities. You know, the devolved um, environment, the commercial environment we currently, we currently exist within in the UK doesn't work um, as we move forward and won't continue to work. Uh, I actually think that not investing in some of this stuff is actually going to, as, as Beatrice has, has already stated, is actually going to impact those communities far greater than, than anything we could, you know, than, than almost doing nothing at this point in time. Um, it's, uh, it's an area we have to invest in. Um, I, I worked on the periphery of a, a DRT scheme in, in, in the States. And one thing it was actually, by, by modeling it properly and by identifying where the, where the real routes were gonna be, and to use coin a bit as um, a phrase, the capillaries, um, they were able to not only put in a DRT service, which is successful and is viable, but also <laughs> which has continued to grow. And they're actually looking at expanding it next year, simply because and even with COVID, it continued to grow, um, bearing in mind that COVID didn't have quite the same impact over there than it did here. Um, so I think there is some work to be done here, and I think we need to better understand it and put into, play, into, into place um, DRT systems or root deviation systems or whatever you want to term it as, uh, which work and work for those communities that they're, 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 they're there to serve. Um, well, another uh, question which has come in, um, and then actually before I go to that one, I'm just going to ask, we mentioned, we, we talked a little bit about the rural and urban question and this idea of capillaries and and uh, basically another thing that you mentioned was infrastructure. And that was something that I have to say, um, when I think about future mobility and technology, I don't necessarily immediately think infrastructure or active travel was another thing you mentioned. So I'm wondering what the panel think, and, and Steve, it would be good to bring in you on this and, and what your experience mm -hmm. in Solent is as well, on um, where we are with our infrastructure for um, some of, for whether it's autonomous vehicles, active travel, demand responsive travel, all the different 
these different aspects of what mobility as a service could provide and and what's required really from an infrastructure perspective. And Steve's on mute if you're speaking. Um, can I come back to that later? Because I need to have a, a quick think about the solar region. If someone else can go first. Sure, sure. Um, I, I, I could put in a little plea for map, map, maps <laughs> and infrastructure to be aligned um, whilst, whilst Steve's having a think, because one of the things that I find absolutely incredible is that every local authority in our country has got a map of where it's built a pavement. Those, that is not accessible publicly as a form of open data. Um, and, and I just find this totally extraordinary. You can um, use Google Maps, you can use Apple Maps, you can use OpenStreetMaps, and the quality of the route that you are given as a walking person or a wheeling person is, is extremely spotty. Um, I have been dumped on a six lane uh, um, motorway junction um, roundabout when, when asking Google Maps whether I could walk somewhere at one point. And at that point, my exasperation, you know, mm. <laughs> um, uh, and I think this is where Mars, you know, if we're going to actually try and have a, a sustainable future with mobility as a service, I think our maps need to be much more accurate and much more inclusive than they currently are. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a really good um, point around the, the mapping, I, I guess, in terms of the, the work we're doing on, on mapping, it's, it's also the routing, but uh, an early, um, issue we had was where people were changing between modes that there wasn't much guidance um so if you're, you're going from the train station to the the bus stop it was how to get there um and that's something we we've tried to tackle uh, recently we also get lots of uh feedback from the users that have been using it over over the summer for example the the cycle routes where the mapping is telling people to to go a certain route but actually the, the infrastructure in place isn't isn't great quality or there's there's an issue with it um i guess it, it is a very good question around infrastructure uh, i guess in the short term we in terms of the app we are looking to to catch up with the infrastructure to provide that service but we do have one eye on, on the facilities and things that are provided in the so Solent region. Um, so for example, um, where we're setting up user preferences within the app, we want uh, users to say, I, I need that disabled seat on that bus. Mm -hmm. We're working with those bus companies to then um, allow us to book that seat via our, our app. So there are, there are lots of bits and pieces of infrastructure out there. And I guess my issue is, or, or my aim is to connect that up and provide that information to, to the, the users of the app. Okay, we're just coming up uh, to the end of time. So I think we're, go we're gonna have to wrap it up there. Um, there have been a couple of questions around uh, the, the, the sort of journey planner app idea and how you know people to the area new to an area will know could know about them and find that information or they're not going to just use google maps and that kind of thing so that's another another question that's that's out there um firstly uh thank you everyone for attending uh today it's been really uh, uh i find it a very enjoyable and, and interactive session with the panelists but um, it's made all the better by your chat and your questions. So thank you for attending and I hope you find it valuable. A really special thank you to our four speakers today, Jorgen Peterson, Steve Longman, Nick Reed, and Bieta Kubitz. I think you'll agree that all their, their uh, presentations and answers to the questions have been, um, have been excellent and really informative. I'm not sure we've come up with all the answers. So we've probably come up with lots more questions, um, but that's the point is to, um, uh, be part of the conversation and that this conversation would keep going um, amongst all the various different uh, uh, people involved and stakeholders involved. Uh, so you, as I said, the recording will be available um, and you'll receive an email with that. The slides will also be included and there'll be contact details for all the speakers if you want to get in touch with them uh, and find out anything in more detail about what they've presented today. Uh, but it just leaves me to say thank you and I hope you have an enjoyable rest of the day.